I um, uh, am delighted to have the opportunity to meet all of you. And um, so I'm looking forward uh, to your asking questions and so forth. If I say something that's unclear while I'm presenting it, just raise your hand. And Jack, you've got to, you've got to look at that carefully because I can't. Uh, I, I have I have I have limited focused ability, so I really have to focus on what I'm talking about here. And if you'll if you'll just let me know if somebody wants to uh, raise something, and then I've left uh, time at the end so that we can have a, a you know, question regular you know larger questions and discussion. So. Uh, let me let me share my screen and um, and let's get underway. Okay, I'm hoping everybody can see this. All right, um, you good? Okay, good. All right. Well, I've, I've entitled this uh, "Finding a Climate Strategy That Works." I think we're all aware that climate change is happening. Uh, but you may not be aware of how long we've known about climate change. Uh, the original idea um, actually was, was or not of climate change, but that the, uh, that the atmosphere somehow warm has a capacity to keep the earth warm was actually uh, worked out in, in 1827, but it wasn't until 1896 that the first uh, scientists to analyze what would happen if we were to increase the heat trapping gases in the atmosphere, particularly carbon dioxide, um, and um, this was a Swedish chemist named Svante Arrhenius, who interestingly enough is an ancestor of Greta Thunberg, the uh, young climate activist who's about your age. Um, and um, he predicted it would double, uh, if you double the carbon dioxide, you'd, you'd raise the temperature four degrees Celsius. And it turns out that the basic range that we have right now from all the science we've done since is it's between one and a half and four and a half degrees. So pretty good for a guy with no, no computer, no calculator, paper and pencil, and some knowledge about how the atmosphere worked. And um, the, in 1827, a French physicist had proposed that somehow the, the gases in the atmosphere trapped heat, much as a glass house uh, traps heat, the so-called greenhouse, we call them, where we grow plants. And if, that had been done in not 1827, but 1927, it would have been called the hot car effect. And uh, you probably read about this in the summer every time that somebody leaves their car, uh, their dog in a car in the summer with the windows up and it may be 80 degrees outside and it's 130 inside and the dog dies. So you see these ads about uh, not, not doing that. It's, uh, it's a, hot oven, a hot oven or a hot car, it's the same thing. So it's the hot car effect. That we're talking about here. And the gases, there are multiple gases. Uh, carbon dioxide is responsible for about two thirds of the heat trapping, but um, methane is also responsible. I'll show you the relative proportions in just a moment. And that's been rising. And uh, nitrous oxide, which comes from uh, nitrogen fertilizer, has also been rising. And it's really stunning to see how these, how these uh, dramatic this has been. This, this scale is 10,000 years. And only uh, about 150 years ago do these gases start increasing. And in the uh, uh, larger uh, scale, uh, they, they, they rise straight up almost because 150 years is pretty small compared to 10,000. And then they just show from about, um, uh, about, uh, well, about 1750, the start of the Industrial Revolution, you can see in the little inset uh, how carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide have increased. And more recently, this is what carbon dioxide growth has looked like. Um, and you can see which countries are responsible. And uh, the United States was uh, the lead uh, producer of carbon dioxide until 2005, when we were surpassed by China. And you can see that kind of um, maroon color there, that's China. And you can see the dramatic growth since around 2000. And what's really stunning to me is that half of all carbon dioxide emitted by human beings has occurred since 1992, starting in 1750 to 1992. And then after 1992, we've emitted the same amount. And 1992 is significant because it's the date of the first climate treaty. So that does that suggests that our treaties have not been very effective, which is a reasonable a reasonable conclusion to draw. And this is just a sort of a cartoon showing how the the heat trapping works, the whole so-called greenhouse effect. 
Uh, the greenhouse gases are the heat trapping gases. They're up in the atmosphere. Uh, heat from the sun or sunlight comes in. Some of it's reflected by clouds. Uh, you can see it here and we have numbers on all of these uh, from the uh, surface of the water and some of it gets absorbed by the earth. The earth warms up, it radiates heat back to space. Some of that's trapped by these gases. Some is radiated up, some is radiated back down, up and down again and again. And that's how the earth is warming up because we're adding more gases all the time. Um, and um, in uh, 2015, uh, the international um, climate goals were determined by, uh, oops, I should say Paris, sorry about the typo there, uh, climate agreement in 2015. And this is a direct quotation from that agreement. This agreement aims to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius, which is, is um, uh, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, just to calibrate those of us who are not metric, uh, which is most Americans, um, uh, to well below two degrees above uh, pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And that latter uh, point of one and a half degrees was put in at the request of uh, a lot of small island nations and Bangladesh and other countries <clears throat> that will, well, some of the island nations will literally disappear under the waves. Um, so um, uh, that was put in because of their concern. So we've got to try hard to stay within one and a half degrees. And in Paris, it was interesting on the Eiffel Tower, this lighted up um, because uh, Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon at this uh, meeting just said, uh, we must pass an agreement here. We've been, they've been trying since 1992 to 2015 to get an agreement that works. And he said, because there is no plan B. And in fact, there is no planet B. Well said. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that one of my doctoral students was the co-chair of the whole process from in 2015 to get to the Paris Agreement. Um, the results of all this warming, wildfires in the American West in 2020. Uh, these are just pictures taken from uh, California and so on. One in an area, a wild area, and another one, uh, homes burning. Uh, Paradise, California was incinerated. Um, and then in Australia, in, uh, in, in the fall of, of 19, 2019 and, and uh, the, the uh, winter of 2020, there were massive fires in Australia. I thought this was an extraordinary photograph with a kangaroo jumping around past a burning building. Um, and, um, and I was in um, Madrid at this uh, uh, international climate conference in December of 2019 with Australian colleagues. I was with a, with there with, as part of a delegation from the Australian University. And my colleagues had an app on their phone where they were looking about eight times a day to see how close the nearest fire was to their home. And these are people who've worked on forests and fire and carbon and climate uh, for 20, 30 years. Um, it hit us here in Boston. Um, in 2018, there was this incredible storm and uh, with, sea, with higher seas, uh, there was a storm surge. And this is what downtown Boston looked like uh, in some areas. This is an area near the, the aquarium, which I guess is appropriate because there it is, the ocean with floating blocks of ice uh, in the streets. And um, this is a, a, a photo taken uh, just north of Boston in a town called Situate. And uh, those who think they would like to have oceanfront property, this suggests maybe you better rethink that plan. Um, and other parts of the world suffered as well. Um, in 2013, uh, Typhoon Haiyan hit the Philippines. And in 2014, Typhoon Hajupit hit the Philippines again. And what's ironic is both of these actually, both of these uh, typhoons hit uh, while governments were meeting in their annual conference of the parties to discuss what should we do about climate. And in 2013, the delegate from, from the Philippines uh, just said he was going on a hunger strike unless every country agreed to do something about climate because until then the rules were that only the developed countries, the richer countries had to do anything, the developing countries did not. 
And he, he just pointed out this had to change. And then when this happened again in 2014, everybody agreed, we're gonna have another meeting a year from now, we're gonna have an agreement. And that was the Paris Agreement. And by the way, you may know that President Trump took the US out of the Paris Agreement, the only country to leave. And on the first day of his new administration, President Biden put us back in. Uh, this is the temperature record uh, from 1850 to uh, 2020. And um, you can see on the very right hand edge that there, uh, 2016 may have been slightly higher. Uh, and, uh, uh, but that's, it, there are certain assumptions as to how you determine the global average temperature. And it's, it's within the bar, uh, margins of error. Those little vertical lines show you what the uncertainty levels are. And all three of those are in the same level. The last six years have been the warmest on record. And you can see that there's a big upsurge. And these ups and downs, the ups are, are what are called El Nino events, where there's heat that comes out of the ocean. The dips at the bottom are La Nina events, when in fact there's um, uh, that heat goes back into the ocean, and we now understand that cycle pretty well. Um, the analysis of this is complicated, and there, there are probably, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 articles a year published on climate change. And there's no way that governments can keep up with that. So in 1989, uh, governments agreed to form an organization called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And uh, this is the cover of the 2007 report. And um, it, um, it's uh, any, any government can belong, and I think every country in the world does belong. And they put out a report like this, which I don't know if your group is still familiar with the printed page, but this is about 3,000 printed pages. It's also online, obviously. And uh, there are three, ver three volumes. One is the science, uh, one is the uh, impacts and vulnerability, and the third one is mitigation, or what do we do about it? So this is mitigation of climate change. That's the area I worked in for 20 years with the IPCC. And um, the, uh, uh, so here are the three categories um, that are the, of, of, the, of things. And in 2007, this particular report was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize jointly with uh, Vice President Al Gore for his uh, book, uh, uh, Earth in the Balance. And um, so the, um, uh, the, um, the, the organization won the, won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. Um, what's interesting about the, this process is that um, it has scientists from all over the world, developed in developing countries. Uh, there's a single uh, 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 chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and then there are uh, co-chairs of each of these three categories, and, the, and one comes from a developed country, one from a developing country. And then for each chapter, there is a coordinating lead author, and it's a developed country and developing country. When I was a coordinating lead author in the first one uh, in uh, 2000, um, and um, let's see, which one was that? That was uh, um, in 2000 and uh, um, uh, 2001, uh, my co-chair was from Brazil. And in the one I did in 2013, uh, my co-chair was from uh, Zambia. Um, it comes with a summary for policymakers, uh, which is about 25 pages long. And that's decided um, uh, governments sign off on this, but it's prepared by the, the, the coordinating lead authors of the chapters and it summarizes all the basic information. And one of the remarkable things about this is while governments get to decide what the summary for policymakers includes, they do not get to decide on the science that's in the document. They cannot change a word of the, of the 3,000 pages. But they may say, I don't want to say such bad things about coal burning or something. And, um, and if, uh, if that can't be resolved, it's just not in the summary for policymakers one way or the other. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty rigorous process. As you can see by the names on here, it's a pretty international group uh, from all over the world. I, I really enjoyed doing it because it was interdisciplinary and it was uh, international. And here's just a kind of statement that was that's in a report like this. This is from the uh, 
uh, from the uh, the uh, fifth assessment report in 2014 or 2013 rather. Uh, from 1750 to 2011, carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel combustion and cement production, production released 375, that's the range of gigatons of carbon, that's billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere, all deforestation and other land use change are estimated to have released 180. So notice this, about one third of all the emissions have come from deforestation and, and uh, uh, destroying wetlands and uh, disrupting uh, grasslands. Um, uh, and, um, and yet we never hear about that, but you're gonna hear about it in just a minute. And so uh, we've added about uh, 555 uh, million tons to the atmosphere. And um, the uh, conclusions are always stated in these very kind of cautious terms. Human influence has been detected. And this evidence is, has grown since the, fifth, the fourth assessment report. It is, quote, extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. And then they give you where it is in the report. So um, in the first one in, uh, that came out in 1990, it said it is possible that human influence is, uh, human activities have influenced the climate. And it grew ever more bold. And what uh, extremely likely means is that there's probably only less than one chance in 20, that's not true. And that's kind of the cautious science that's done. Now, this is an interesting graphic that's in that report. Um, and it shows something called radiative forcing since 1750. And it's the amount of extra um, uh, heating uh, per second that is, is in the earth because of different gases. And so you can see at the top, carbon dioxide is the biggest contributor. And then methane and water vapor and um, methane is the, is the light brown there. That's the next biggest one. Uh, uh, and um, uh, carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide from other uh, sources than, uh, than fossil fuels. And then uh, there's something called the uh, halo carbons. That's a big one. Uh, nitrous oxide we talked about, that's at the bottom there. And then there's some other gases. And then down at the bottom, it says, um, uh, you know, changes in solar irradiance. That is, has the sun gotten, so, somewhere you'd say, oh, it's just the fact the sun's gotten hotter. And you can see the sun may have gotten very slightly hot, hotter since 1750, but it's a little tiny gray bar down here at the bottom. Uh, and we're pretty certain that that's the most it could be. So it's not much. And so if we look at the total effect in 19, by 1950, it was about 0.6 watts per square meter. So a watt is, uh, you know, you have a light bulb and it puts out, you know, it uses electricity and the old 100 watt light bulbs were, were an amazing technology that Thomas Edison invented, but which uh, used a, a hundred watts of electricity to produce five watts of light and 95 watts of heat. And um, anyway, by 1950, it was about 0.6 and by 2011, it was uh, well over two. And uh, today it's more like two and a half. So, um, so these are these are some changes, and this is this helps us keep track of how we're doing. And the answer is we're not doing well. So, um, governments asked the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They said, "Hey, we just decided we should try to stay between one and below one and a half degrees Celsius, two point seven degrees Fahrenheit. How do we do that?" It's an interesting way to make policy. You know, we'll set a goal and then we'll ask, how do we do it? Um, and so this is a direct quote. So, so basically, uh, to meet the one and a half degree goal, global net anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions must decline by about 45% from 2005 levels by 2030, reaching net zero around 2050. Well, last time I looked, this is 2021. So we have nine years to reduce by 45% because we haven't reduced much. We did reduce a little bit this past year, but <clears throat> of course that would have to do with the pandemic. So um, uh, what we must do is, it points this out, we must simultaneously reduce combustion emissions from our fossil fuels and from industry and cement making and so on, and simultaneously remove atmospheric carbon dioxide. 
And the best means we have for doing that is by forest growth. And here's kind of, these are scenarios for getting uh, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, emissions going up the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. This goes out beyond 2100. And so you see there sometime around uh, uh, 2050, you're down by roughly half. And um, then you actually have to get into net negative emissions, meaning that somehow we're removing more than we're putting in. And um, so here's one, there's a lot of talk about these uh, technologies, uh, these carbon dioxide sucker uppers uh, that will, uh, um, for, for uh, it's, it's um, th this one, uh, by the way, uh, has removed something like, uh, like uh, I think it's um, uh, 400 tons of carbon, uh, it's carbon dioxide a year, um, and it takes a lot of energy. So what about, what else is going on? And so I'm gonna just show you, this is from a, a report that comes out every single year by about 50 scientists who look at the, the, where the carbon is in the world and where it's uh, being removed and where it's being released. And if you look over here on the left side, you see their coal reserves, oil reserves, and natural gas reserves, and they are emitting 9.4 um, um, billion tons a year. And there's this little orange arrow that's, that's, that's basically land use change. So it's mostly deforestation. That's 1.6 billion. And because this is relatively small compared to fossil fuel emissions, people sort of say, well, forests don't have a role to play. And I'll show you why that was a mistake. But anyway, you add these two emissions together and what you discover is it's 11 billion tons of carbon. Now, carbon dioxide is heavier than just the carbon in it, but we keep track of it, we'll just look at the carbon. Okay, then what? Well, we put in 11 billion tons and how much appears every year? 5.1. Wait, we put in 11 and we only get 5.1. So what's happening? What's happening is the oceans are removing two and a half billion and the forests and uh, other plants on land are moving 3.4 and that totals 5.9 and 5.9 and 5.1 add up to 11. So nature has been helping us enormously. And I'm sort of embarrassed about this, but it wasn't until about 10 or about 12 years ago that I began to realize that this is the number we should be looking at, not this one. This is in excess of what, because forests are actually removing about 125 billion tons a year. And they are releasing, or here, about 120, here we are. Uh, they're, 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 they're removing about 120 billion tons. They're releasing 120 billion tons. tons. An extra 1.6 is coming out because of, of uh, deforestation. And 3.4 is being absorbed beyond this 120 that balances. So we, where is that coming from and why is it happening? And that's gonna be a, a point of, of the rest of my talk. But so um, we talk about being net zero carbon. That's what the Paris Agreement says. And how does it differ from zero emissions? So net zero means that we are emitting carbon, burning fossil fuels, but neither either nature or technology are moving as much as emitted. That's what net zero would mean. So we've got to get to net zero, either technologically or by nature. And so if nature gets to that point, we're at net zero. And, uh, but when we use something like solar panels or wind turbines, that's truly zero because it's making energy without any emissions at all. Now there were some emissions that went into making it, but those are paid back rather rapidly within usually a year or less, maybe two years at the most. And after that, for the next 30, 40 years of that device, it is generating energy, electricity or something without anything. So we, we, we have to do that. We must, we must replace our fossil fuels with non-emitting sources. And so that means things like wind turbines. Uh, it means uh, that's truly zero carbon. And then we need to figure out how to, how to generate, another is solar panels. And so this is a zero net, net energy 
home. And here are solar panels on the roof here, there's solar panels back here. Um, and how do you, you get all the energy you need here uh, from that? Well, you make every this thing in this house super efficient. So the walls are 12 inches thick. By the way, this is uh, right on the border with Southern Vermont. There, there are still uh, temperatures of minus 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the winter. And this house stays completely warm because it is so well insulated and it's heated entirely by uh, extracting heat from that's stored in the ground, solar energy that's stored in the ground. And then there's a heat pump that raises that temperature, which is around 55 degrees uh, up to a comfortable 75 degrees in the house, if you like. And uh, it's, um, it produces over the year, it's connected to the grid. So at night you draw from the grid and you pay somebody to generate the electricity for wind power or something. So it's also non-carbon emitting. And uh, then in the daytime, you may be generating more than you're using and that gets exported back to the grid and that cancels out what you brought in the night before. So over the year, it's zero net energy and it is in fact zero carbon. And uh, this is the house I'm speaking to you from right now. Uh, we designed it 15 years ago, moved into it uh, almost 14 years ago, uh, 13, 13 and a half years ago. And um, it is uh, performing really, really very well. It's the most comfortable house I've ever been in. And then what about transportation? And if you look at um, what's happening, it's an interesting change. After the Volkswagen scandal with their diesels, sales of diesel cars have gone down significantly. This is in Europe. And um, gasoline cars went up and they're coming back down and electrified vehicles are going up. And um, uh, vehicles like this, this is a Tesla, obviously. Uh, there's also uh, uh, the Chevy Bolt, which is, uh, which is less expensive. But the basic model of the Tesla now sells for $1,000 less than the median price of automobiles in the United States last year. That's an amazing accomplishment because it is a luxury car and it's considered a luxury car. It runs 100% on electricity stored in its batteries. And it is an amazing, amazing technological accomplishment. And then of course, the best thing is that we don't drive as much as possible. We, uh, particularly if we live in cities, we, we use public transportation or we walk or we use bicycles or whatever. And those transformations are taking place. Um, but let's look at this other side of the equation. Um, uh, so we're removing th the forests are, and, and other plants on land are removing 3.6 billion tons of carbon a year, which is uh, something like 30% of all our emissions, uh, almost a third. And um, I became aware of some research that was being done, and I'll just recite it to you here. Um, uh, a group in Germany, uh, Professor Erb and others, uh, did an analysis that said altering forest management to let more trees grow would allow global forests to accumulate twice as much carbon as they now have. That's pretty amazing. So our management is somehow keeping our forests from absorbing more carbon. And then another paper by another scientist who's actually in the United States uh, found, and this is a direct quotation from the paper, the largest 1% of trees in mature and older forests comprised 50% of forest biomass worldwide. Let that sink in. What that means is that half of all the carbon stored in trees is in the largest 1% diameter tree. So out of 100 trees, on average, one of them storing half. Actually, of the sites that were in the United States, it's more like 30% instead of 50% because we don't let our forests get very big. We harvest them before they get big. And then um, a paper just came out in September that said that the potential for growing forests to accumulate carbon by natural regrowth is better than active management and has been underestimated by about a third. That is a great finding for telling us where we might go to improve things. But we've known this for a long time. For example, you'll sometimes hear from foresters that, well, little trees grow faster than big trees. 
um, well, there is a portion of time when they do grow faster than really big, really big old trees. But if you look at a forest as a whole, in 1990, this study was done out in, in uh, Oregon, uh, found that an old growth forest that had never been harvested was storing 611 um, uh, tons of carbon per, it's actually per hectare, but that doesn't matter. It's two and a half acres. And uh, one that's managed and harvested sustainably every 60 years is only storing 274. So a harvest forest has not accumulated as much as an old forest. And so here's how it works if you think about it. So this green thing here represents the total amount of carbon that was in the forest originally. It gets harvested, boom, it goes way down. But then we let it regrow and then we harvest it again. We let it regrow and we harvest it again. So the average now in the forest is this red line. And the average had it kept on, uh, uh, kept staying the same. And by the way, this only counts the trees. It doesn't count the additional accumulation that goes on in the soils is this amount here. So this is far less on average and very much more that's in the atmosphere if we harvest a forest and even if we let it grow back. Here in the Northeast, um, studies were done on different forms of harvesting. And the light color here is the amount of carbon that is stored in wood products. Because you often hear this, oh, wood products, let's cut down trees and we'll store the wood, the, the carbon in wood products. Uh, well, okay, at best it's about half. And, uh, and, and, uh, and if you look at the total, it's relatively low here for a clear cut. Uh, it's about 70 um, million grams of carbon per hectare. On the other hand, if you do no management at all, it's about 160. So again, it's, it's twice, as, twice as much uh, stored in an unmanaged forest than in one, even if you count what is in wood products. And a, a col some colleagues of mine in, out in Oregon did an analysis that looked at all the carbon, all the, all the carbon that's been harvested. And by the way, carbon is, is half of the weight of dry wood in a tree. And that counts the branches, the, the trunk, the, the roots. Um, and so where has that gone? And, and, the, and since 1900, when the, when the industry started in Oregon until 2015, we found that indeed some of it is in long-lived wood products, 19% of all that has ever been harvested since 1900. 16% uh, of it is in landfills and 65% or virtually two thirds is in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So that's a stunning finding. Uh, so um, um, now um, this is a picture taken in uh, Massachusetts, which has uh, the um, uh, the tallest out of the top 10, I think uh, two of the tallest 10 trees in the whole Northeast are in uh, Massachusetts. And, um, um, and this is one of them. This, this tree is storing about seven tons of carbon. And uh, I'm standing here next to it for scale. And uh, we, we hear a lot about, we're gonna plant a trillion trees, or we're gonna plant a lot of trees. And that's a good thing to do, but letting them grow is better. And uh, we call this uh, the process of letting trees grow proforestation management. Uh, there is, um, if you, if you, uh, forestation means uh, growing a forest and deforestation means we have um, uh, cut down a forest and reforestation means we've let it grow back and afforestation means we have planted a forest somewhere where it wasn't otherwise growing. But since there was no term for letting forests grow, um, uh, we coined one. It's called proforestation. And this allows forests to reach their biological potential for carbon storage in trees and in soils. And um, uh, larger trees accumulate the most atmospheric carbon over time and store the carbon in the wood of their trunk and limbs. <clears throat> and, um, and, and also in, in, in the soils, that's important because on old forests, 
half the carbon is stored in the soils. So um, uh, let me just show you how this works. Um, this is based on studies that we've done here in the Northeast United States. And this happens to be a particular species, it's white pine. And it is, it is, uh, uh, it, it's, it includes some of those big, that big tree I just showed you. And here are the tons of carbon per acre. And uh, what we did is we looked at, at uh, stands of trees, of these trees at different ages. And then we interpolated to get these 50, 100, and 150 year values. So it turns out that a, um, a, a, if, you, if you look at a stand of white pine that's 50 years old, it has 22 tons, okay? If you look at one that has 100, it's 100 years old, it has 47 tons. If you look at a stand that has 100, it's 150 years old, it has almost 76 tons. Now, what will happen if I um, harvest that 50-year-old forest, cut it down, and use it somehow? Well, it goes to zero. And uh, 22 tons goes into some of it into the atmosphere. About half of it goes into the atmosphere, and half of it goes into wood products. And that's the story. And so you can see that if I let it grow then for another, 20, uh, another 50 years, I'm back to 22 tons if all goes well. But had I let it grow, it would be 47 tons. So this is the penalty we pay by the way we manage sustainably. And if I do it for another, uh, another 50 years, I, I now harvest the, the, this 22 tons of, and that goes to zero in the forest. And then we let it grow back and we're at 22 again, if we're lucky. But had we let it keep growing, it would be almost 76 tons. So this is, this is what proforestation is. Proforestation would be to let a 50-year-old forest grow to be a 150-year-old forest, or a 100-year-old forest to be 150 years old, or a 75-year-old forest to become 150 years old. And that will accumulate the most carbon in the coming um, uh, decade, till 2030 and to 2050 and up till 2100. There is no advantage in cutting down a big old tree, which will release half the carbon to the atmosphere immediately and um, planting fast growing younger trees. They will never catch up until they're as big as that tree. So here are the strategies for closing the, the so-called sequestration gap between what we're emitting and what nature is taking out. So we need to prevent deforestation, have to prevent the draining of wetlands. Wetlands st store the most carbon per acre of anything. And uh, if we disturb them, they release it within days, weeks, months. It's, there, it's all released to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide or methane, worse. And um, restore them, is restoring the ones that have been damaged is essential. And we have to do that if we're going to avoid irreversible at irreversible and catastrophic climate change. And so proforestation management is far more effective than planting a trillion trees. You're, a lot of corporations are talking about being carbon, uh, zero net carbon or carbon neutral by 2050. And they're gonna do it by planting a bunch of trees. And they're gonna count them as having absorbed the carbon the day they're planted. And of course, they won't have absorbed anything by then. And by the time you get to 2050, they will not have absorbed anything like what that company has generated during that time. So uh, um, poor reforestation is also one of the least costly options for removing and storing additional atmospheric carbon. So I would say, let it grow. And um, let me just say something now about scientists as advocates. So, um, there's a, a letter that was sent to heads of state on February 11th that I and some other people organized. It was signed by just over 500 scientists. You can find it at this uh, link. And um, uh, it's a letter regarding the use of forest for bioenergy, that is burning it instead of coal. And people say, well, it's carbon neutral because a tree will grow back. But as you've just seen, it takes a long time for it to grow back. And this, this letter explains that to President Biden uh, the president uh, <clears throat> of the um, European Union 
uh, the prime minister of Japan and the president of Korea. And we also ended up sending it to the prime minister of, uh, of the United Kingdom. And this is just showing, you know, names that we have, uh, of various people who signed it. And, um, and it goes on for 500 names and from all over the world, uh, which is great. So, uh, so what do scientists hope to accomplish by this? Well, this is the first paragraph of a paper that I co-authored uh, that was published in December or November of 2019. Uh, scientists have a moral obligation to clearly warn humanity of any catastrophic threat and to tell it like it is. On the basis of this obligation and the graphical indicators below, we declare with more than 11,000 scientists signatories from around the world, clearly and unequivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. Lo and behold, in 2019, when we published this, this became uh, a, um, uh, one of the most used phrases, climate emergency, uh, reported by the Oxford Dictionary. So I was very proud of the fact that we chose it before we knew that was the case. Uh, so here it is. Here's the cover page. And here's the statement I just read to you. And uh, they're from the scientists are from 153 countries. And since then, uh, it's now almost 14,000 from 156 countries. So scientists are really concerned. And this just shows some of the trends. And I won't go through all of them because it would take too long. But most of them are bad. Um, everything, everything that could be causing climate change seems to be going up. And the things that would halt it are going down. So here, this one down here. Um, uh, subsidies for fossil fuels were rising, they fell, and now they're heading back up again. That's terrible. That's not what we need to be doing, subsidizing fossil fuels. We need to be subsidizing solutions to fossil fuels. And this is then showing what's happening. This middle row shows all these declines are the loss of ice, uh, Arctic sea ice, uh, Greenland, Antarctica, and the glaciers of the world. And uh, that's all having incredible implications for the climate overall. So at the climate conference of the parties where the governments meet to decide what they're going to do in December of 2019, I saw this poster and I just had to take a picture of it. Don't call it change, call it climate emergency, which I thought was exactly the right thing. And a, um, a really prominent uh, uh, scientist who actually helped solve the ozone depletion problem, Mario Molina, uh, he shared the Nobel prize for his work on that uh, in, um, in um, 1995, made the following statement. The, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report demonstrates that it is still possible to keep the climate relatively safe, provided we muster an unprecedented level of cooperation, extraordinary speed and heroic scale of action. But even with its description of the increasing impacts that lie ahead, the IPCC understates a key risk that self-reinforcing feedback loops could push the climate system into chaos before we have time to tame our energy system and the other sources of climate pollution. So it's a, it's a yes, we can do it, but we've got to count everything. Um, as you may know, Pope Francis has made statements about uh, how important climate is. His Laudato Si, his uh, encyclical was all about climate. And uh, when you read that, I must say he, he, had, he had great help from some great scientists in putting that together. I don't, by the way, he has a, he has a degree in chemistry, just so you know. Um, and um, uh, I happen to know that the lead scientist he worked with was uh, actually a German scientist who was an atheist. So how about that for being ecumenical? Um, so who speaks for the treaties? And uh, many of you may know the Lorax, uh, uh, Dr. Seuss's book, The Lorax which ends with this phrase, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. And that's that wonderful story about um, the, uh, the greed that cut the last uh, tuffle of tree and uh, uh, smogged up the air and so forth. And, uh, and the Lorax is the one who speaks for nature. Um, and it's not just the Lorax who's speaking for the trees, climate scientists do, if you please. And uh, then this young woman, Greta Thunberg, who at age 15, first spoke at, a, at one of these government climate meetings in Poland. 
and shocked the world with her statements. And she is now, she just turned 18 in January and uh, she speaks out. Uh, and this is a great phrase of hers. Adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope. I don't want your hope, I want you to act. I want you to act as if the house was on fire because it is. And she and her family, her parents have written a book uh, called a House on Fire. And it, it's, it's really a fascinating read. And I had the pleasure of meeting her in December, 2019 and served on a panel with her that she and another uh, young person had organized with a group of five scientists, two of whom were co-chairs of the IPCC. And we just talked about what needed to be done. And she just, uh, uh, she's just remarkable in terms of her effectiveness and what she's done. And um, I had again, the privilege just uh, in February to be on a, uh, a, a, a web produced uh, production on climate change and those feedback loops, the way in which warming begets more warming uh, with, uh, with Greta and the Dalai Lama whose organization broadcast it to a million people. Uh, and uh, this is what we need. We need the action of everyone and young people's action, I think is more effective, frankly, than those of us of the older generation. So thank you. Let me stop there and uh, turn it back to Jack. Uh, yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, we've really got a lot out of that. Uh, could you take a second to maybe explain a little bit more into the feedback loops for people who didn't get a chance to kind of check all that out? Sure. Um, let me give you some examples. <clears throat> well, one is that's very simple is that um, as, as, uh, as the climate warms, um, all plants and all bacteria, their metabolism speeds up. And by the metabolism, what they do is they, uh, they eat uh, carbon containing molecules just like we do. And uh, 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 that generates energy, which becomes chemical energy, which runs our cells and our bodies, and it runs trees and it lets them grow leaves and everything else. And uh, they respire carbon dioxide and water. Well, so the photosynthesis is the opposite. It takes carbon dioxide and water and in the presence of energy from the sun, it makes wood. And so if you look at the total uh, primary production, and then you look at respiration, the difference is, is what they're storing. And so as it gets warmer and they respire more, they're storing less. So there's a feedback which reduces the capacity of nature to work. Another one is the uh, warming of the Arctic uh, has, um, uh, has, has melted a lot of sea ice and a lot of land, land ice. And that was highly reflected. 90% of the sunlight's reflected. It's replaced with dark wa water and dark soil. And so something like 85% of the heat of the sun's energy is absorbed. Well, that's warming it up in an accelerating rate. And that is thawing the permafrost. And the, in the permafrost is a lot of dead organic matter and the bacteria are having a field day. As one of my colleagues who works in the Arctic says, it's as though you, took out some frozen chicken, went away for a week on vacation, forgot you'd done it, and you come back and it's, it's just an awful mess of, because the bacteria have really turned it into in, in actually carbon dioxide, water, and, and, a, and a stinking mess. And that's what we're doing. So these feedbacks are accelerating things. And that's changing everything from the jet stream to the Gulf Stream. So the atmospheric currents are changing, the ocean currents are changing, all of that is changing climate. And these weird weather patterns are the result of that. So that's just, just an example of feedbacks. So thank you for asking that clarification, Jack. So uh, I just also wanted to touch on this. So like, this is obviously like, it seems like you're looking up a mountain. This is just a huge global issue. What can we do? Cause especially we're such a small state, like it's easy to do things locally. What can we do to like yeah. combat this? Yeah. Well, two things. I mean, one is, is, to, is to move rapidly to reduce emissions from every source possible. And so at your school, um, at your home, um, um, work, work on your parents to get them at the, to, to work at their business to reduce it. Um, you know, it, it's going to be done. 
there's not going to be a grand treaty internationally that's going to solve the problem. There's not even going to be a uh, U.S. law that by itself is going to solve the problem. I mean, look how much difficulty we're having uh, addressing this, this COVID uh, pandemic because I don't want to wear a mask, right? I don't want to be socially distanced. I want to go out and play. I want to go on an airplane. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of selfish and we, we don't think of the consequences. And meanwhile, we've, we've killed over a half a million people and we'll probably kill another half a million before it's over. I don't think that's a very good model to have. I'd like to see that one where we actually are preventing these deaths and pre preventing all these problems and all these hurricanes and all these fires and everything. Um, and so it's in our interest. This is really in our interest to do something. And I think, I think um, younger people, I mean, you, you're going to have to live with the consequences longer than I am, that's for sure. And so therefore you have a, not only a greater stake, I think you have even a greater legitimacy than I do to say to do something about it. You know, I can claim it's necessary because I have grandchildren your age, but, but that's not nearly as effective as saying, hey, it's, it's me, it's affecting me, and uh, you can't do that. And um, uh, so I wouldn't play the guilt trip too much, but I would, I would, uh, I would instead offer solutions. And uh, so I just, I just gave you a couple of, a couple of examples. But, but learn about the solutions uh, that you can have. And, and Delaware does have some forested lands. And uh, I don't know how they're managed in Delaware. Uh, whether you have some state parks and things, but some of them. I mean, here in Massachusetts, we, we harvest on our state, state parks and, and our state forests, I mean, which is crazy. No, no need to. We have lots of other forests that are privately owned. We're undermining their ability to sell into the market and we're just making more of it into, into carbon dioxide in the air. So um, I don't know, I'll be glad to talk with people more about things you can do, but I'm, I'm, I just think it's, uh, and I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to put the whole burden on you. I mean, I'm still working on it and, uh, and uh, all my colleagues uh, who are my age and older and younger and everything, are, we're, we're, we're going full, full time on this uh, because we think it's so critical. So we're asking you to join us. Oh, that was great, thank you. Uh, I know Kelsey just uh, has a question. Yeah, um, so what is something that we could do as everyday consumers to help contribute with the, our situation in relationship with uh, climate change? Um, well, first of all inform yourself about what you know what things you're doing make a difference and you know there's a lot of talk about uh, about diet um you know it, in, in the u.s uh, between 30 and 40 percent of the food uh that uh, <clears throat> that uh, we produce is wasted and and about a th about a, th a third of that or, or most of that waste is between the supermarket and the and and the garbage can or the garbage disposal so we're very wasteful about uh, about our food, and uh, that could make uh, you think about this. Uh, I mean, agriculture is one of the leading producers of, of greenhouse gases in the United States, and so if if a third of it is just being wasted, that means a third of all the greenhouse gases emitted for agriculture serve no useful purpose, right? So that's that's one way to think about it. Is is and so so that's one thing. And the other thing, of course, is the choice of diet and. It's clear that uh, 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 you know uh, uh, meat uh, production produces more greenhouse gases than uh, than a vegetarian diet. Not all of us want to be vegetarians. Well, you know, let's how about less meat? Uh, uh, you know, that's you don't have to be a purist on this. I mean, some people like being purists, and I admire them for so, for doing so. But but um, it, it, if I mean whether it's just meatless Monday or what, whatever it might be. You say, okay, that's I'm going to start there. Um, uh, that's probably the thing you have the most control over. Uh, the other one is just the way you manage your energy use in your home. Um, you know the uh, the, um, the 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 hot water that's wasted, but the you know, the shower running too long, or the um, uh, even little things. If if you have a, if you heat water in one of those electrical electric kettles. Uh, I know in, in Great Britain, they found, uh, you know, the British drink a lot of tea and they use those uh, electric tea kettles. They estimated that everybody fills it to the top 
and they only use a half to two thirds of it. The extra amount that's heated requires an entire, the electricity from an entire nuclear power plant. I mean, that, that's stunning, right? <laughs> uh, or, or, or a big coal plant, whatever, you know. So, so uh, just thinking about those things. And yes, when, you, when your parents tell you to turn off the lights when you leave the room, yes, that's a good thing to do for the climate. Uh, and, uh, and just being, being responsible as, as in, in the way you use your energy is, is important. Um, we found, uh, you know, okay, we do have to drive because we're in an area that we don't have public transportation. Uh, but we've started chaining our 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 uh, our trips so that we don't. Uh, oh, I've got to get some uh, Scotch tape. Let me go run to the store and get some Scotch tape. Uh, oh, I think we're out of oranges. Let's go get some oranges. Now we put all that on a list, and then we do it all in one trip. And that we've reduced our driving miles by a significant amount. Um, and of course, now it, it helps because we have a, a, um, a battery powered electric vehicle and we charge it from our own solar panels. That is really satisfying. Uh, and um, as one person who said after he put in a solar hot water heater, he said, uh, you never feel cleaner in a shower than you after one that's been solar heated. He said that just, you know, you, you, you know you're doing it with the least, least impact. So I don't know, it, it's attitude, I guess, is what makes it what it is. Okay, good. Thanks for the question. Others? Oh, that was, that was great. Uh, Mallory has a question next, I think. Yeah, so um, within our group, we've worked pretty heavily with advocating for community solar implemented in Delaware and offshore wind. So I was wondering um, your take on kind of how those are related to cutting CO2 emissions. Yeah, those are those are big, big, big things to do because even after you become much more efficient and and reduce your energy use a lot, we still have to supply some. And so, if we can supply it in a way, uh, you're talking about about doing it at the um, at the uh, grid scale. So we need we need. It's an important point. We need to work at all the different scales from our own use all the way to what's going to supply what we still have to do. And so the examples you cite, those are great. And I know offshore from, uh, from uh, roughly Delaware up through New England is some of the best offshore wind uh, places in, in the world, actually. So uh, um, uh, don't be shy, you know, uh, uh, let, let the governor know, let your let legislators know, uh, uh, let, um, uh, you can write letters to the editor, you can write, uh, you can you can call into talk shows. You can I mean there are a lot of ways you can you can let people know that we think this is a good idea. So those are good examples. Thank you. All right, and then I know Jake had one next. Um, yeah. So when you mentioned proforestation, uh, I saw the data you used went up to like 150 years. Yes. I was just wondering if there's like any research on like what happens after that 150? Is it a sure. good idea to keep them growing after that? Yeah, point? it is. It is because it turns out that white. It, it depends on the species, obviously, but and and the growing conditions of that area. Uh, for these particular pines, um, uh, we we have some left that are approaching. They're probably 190 years old. They're still taking up carbon, and they accumulate more between 150 and 190 years. And so it'd be foolish to take them down. Um, nobody knows for sure because we don't have any trees, I think that are more than about 200 years old. Um, you know, uh, I'm in Massachusetts and they arrived 400 years ago last year and, and uh, began cutting down trees immediately. So we, we were through, I don't know, four or five, who knows how many cuttings have taken place of our forest. <clears throat> and so they've never gotten this big. These are, these are odd remnants that uh, it's not from planning, it was, it's accident, right? It, we were just fortunate this, this accidentally happened. So we can actually see what's happening. So um, um, uh, the oldest tree, or some of the oldest trees we have, of course, are on the West Coast, the, the redwoods and the giant sequoias. Some of those are 2000 years old. They're still growing and they're still adding carbon. And so why would you cut them down? Well, about, 
80% of them, 90, almost 90% of them were cut down. And so we ha now have some forests of those that are, are, are 90 years old. Um, uh, we still have some of the 2000 year old ones, but that's only because everybody got up and they said, we want to make a national park. We want to make some state parks. We want to protect these trees. Uh, so, you know, all of that, all of that's important, but it's wonderful to find these, these wonderful relic old growth forests that we have here in the East. And there are more of them actually down in uh, the, the Great Smoky Mountains. And uh, there are some in upper New York state because in, and uh, here's an example of political action. <clears throat> in the 1890s, the citizens of New York said that they wanted to protect this area that had some old, old growth forests in it. And they put it into the state constitution that the Ad Adirondack Park had to be forever wild. Okay, so there's a case where uh, aren't we glad that 120, 30 years ago, somebody did thought to do that. Um, so we have a chance to have people 130 years from now be grateful for what we do today. All right, I, I had a question, uh, just kind of a broad question. I know you've worked a lot internationally. So, and you've probably experienced this a good bit. So what happens when people are really just against all of this stuff, or like against all of the renewable energies and, st and stuff like that? What's the best method of combating that? Well, it used to be the case, and I get this from my, from colleagues from India and China and uh, and Brazil and so forth. They'd say, well, you're telling us that, okay, all right, so we're just developing, we can make better choices, but you're not using solar panels. You're not using wind turbines. It's true, right? Well, we are using them now, and uh, they are now the cheapest thing we can do. And so everything else is more expensive. Uh, and, uh, and, and burning wood is the most expensive way to make electricity short of nuclear power, right? Nuclear power is the most expensive. It has the advantage it doesn't emit carbon dioxide or anything, but it's still really expensive and it has other, other issues as we all know. And um, so, um, and batteries have improved so much that battery storage of electricity is, uh, is, is, is much more feasible. We find in our home, we, we um, um, the total amount of electricity we use, and we, we're heating with electricity because we're using this heat pump and so forth, which we get uh, three, three plus units of heat for every unit of, of electrical energy we put in. That's a pretty good deal, right? That's better than 100%. It's almost 300, it's 300% uh, return on our, on, on our energy use. And uh, that's because we're transferring heat from the ground. We're transferring for two, two units of heat from the ground for every one unit of, of heat we make with the electricity. And so that's how it, you know, it's not, it's not magic. It's, it's actually well, you know, it, it obeys the law of conservation of energy, which is, is, is a good thing. Uh, uh, and, and so, well, anyway, just, just, just trying to suggest some ways of thinking about it. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. Uh, so anybody else have some questions? Um, I have one. So we recently have in the offshore wind category, we've started working on um, talking to people down in Rehoboth about the current project that is being proposed um, down there to try to get the residents to be in support of it so that the state, you know, sooner passes the bill. And we've come into some people who kind of it seems don't understand how drastic and how dire this situation is because, you know, they're talking to us about their view and the, the hazard lights at night and things like that. How do we, um, how do we make them aware like that things are really this bad and that, like Greta said that the house is on fire. We need to act now. And this is not something that we have time to wait on. Right. Well, you know, we lost a, we had a great opportunity to put in a great uh, offshore wind project about uh, 20 years ago here in Massachusetts, the Cape wind project. And none other than uh, Senator Kennedy opposed it because it would ruin his view from Cape Cod. It was going to be so far offshore that they would look like they were maybe a half an inch high on the horizon or something. But no, don't want it, don't want it, don't want it. And they managed to kill it. Um, and uh, and that, that was opposed by people with a lot of money. And they put a lot of money into killing it. And um, so what you need to do, I think, is um, 
first of all, you're, you're on the right track. You know, this is really serious and we're all going to have to, you know, uh, maybe give up something, uh, but we're going to gain a lot and we're going to gain a lot for everyone. And the other thing is uh, with these new offshore projects, they are further offshore. So they're even less visible and some of them are actually over the horizon. So you can't, you can't be seen. Um, the problem we're running into in Massachusetts now is then the fishermen are saying, oh, but that's where I want to run my fishing boat. Well, you know, those wind turbines are so far apart and they've discovered that when you, when you build the, the um, structures that support them, that they attract a lot of fish. They're kind of like an artificial reef. So it actually increases the amount of fish that are available for fishing. Uh, you just have to steer your boat a little carefully so you don't run into the wind turbine uh, tower. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and if they're spaced far enough apart, there should be no problems, uh, but there will be claims. And so those have to be refuted by facts and there are facts you can use. And, and then at some point, you know, I hope, I hope we're getting back to a, a country that is, uh, has majority rule. Uh, the majority could just say this is the way it's going to be, you know, uh, and uh, you know, there are attempts being made to make that not possible in a lot of states right now, which is, I think is appalling. It's an undermining our whole democracy and everything it stands for. Um, so we, you have to be, um, be active. And uh, I know, um, I mean, I have a granddaughter who's 17 and she was deeply disappointed she couldn't vote this last time. Uh, but you'll be able to vote the next time. And uh, so I, I urge all of you uh, to, uh, to register as soon as you can and to go and vote. Uh, not only on this, but you know, we have social justice issues. We have lots of things that need fixing in our society. And uh, I think uh, your, your cohort is, uh, um, is, can play a major role in that. That was a really great answer. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go another call for questions. All right. I, I, I think we've got everything. Okay. Well, I, 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 wait, did Jake just raise his hand? I don't know. Oh, okay. No, Jake was just All right. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, well, thank you for inviting me, and I hope this was informative. And uh, and if you're going to post it, uh, more people can actually uh, can actually see it. So, yeah. Um, hopefully, it's useful. Thank you so much. This was an honor to be able to talk to you. This was amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. This means a lot to us. Thank you so much for yeah. your time. Well, I'm glad to do it. I just think, as I said, I'm really committed to working with with the younger generation as much as I can to uh, to help them get off to a running start um, so that they can play a major role. You, you really That's are, great, thank you. You really are important. So thank you for having me. Take care. All right, thank you. Best wishes to all. Good.